So thanks to Dirk and to the other organizers for putting together this incredibly interesting conference and for inviting me, despite the fact that I obviously don't fit in. Um, my research isn't on manuscript culture and orality, it's on print and orality, and it's not on the ancient or medieval worlds, but on colonial Africa. But I'm extremely glad to be here all the same, because I can see points of contact between several of the situations that we've been hearing described yesterday and today with the textual cultures that I'm working on. And it's also suggesting new angles which are inspired by the very differences, divergences between these contexts. So my topic is Yoruba language, print culture in early 20th century Lagos. Now, how does this thing go forward? Uh -huh. Okay. Um, early 20th century Lagos and its interactions with oral genres. By the 1920s in colonial Lagos, printed texts in English and in Yoruba had been produced and circulated for more than half a century. But in the 1920s, they were enjoying an unprecedented surge of activity, proliferating, diversifying, and experimenting with genre, which was made possible by expanding literacy, first of all. In the 1921 census, it was calculated that 30% of the inhabitants of Lagos could read, which was an incredibly high proportion for that period, although only 10% could also write. Um, so it was made possible by this expansion of literacy, but it was fueled by political contests within the educated elites and between radical sections of the elite and the colonial government. So this stimulated a, a furore of, of polemical publications. But the key thing is that this print culture, which had become so dynamic at this period, had not been preceded by a major long-lasting manuscript culture. Arabic script had been known through Islam since the early 19th century, but not by many people and only in religious contexts. So everyday literacy for domestic and social purposes was brought by Christian missionaries in the mid 19th century. And the interesting thing is that they introduced writing and print simultaneously. So literacy was inseparable from the idea of reading prints and putting things into prints. First thing the missionaries did was to set up printing presses and get to work translating the Bible and other texts um, and begin producing devotional works, news sheets, school primers, in the belief that reading in and of itself promoted self-reflection and enlightenment, and that the fastest way to spread reading was to produce printed texts in Yoruba. So this process was actually assisted by the existence of a small class of people who were already literate before the missionaries arrived, having been sold as slaves, rescued by the anti-slavery squadron in the high seas, and deposited in Sierra Leone, where many of them converted to Christianity, attended school, learned English, and often trained in a, in a profession which included the law, the church, and medicine. So Lagos by the early 20th century was full of lawyers, full of clerks, full of clergymen, and even a couple of doctors. 
because these Sierra Leoneans, as they call themselves, Saro, uh, from the mid 19th century began making their way back to their putative homelands in western Nigeria, where they formed the core of a new elite defined by education and by proximity to the missionary and colonial presence. However, print didn't remain in the hands of the missionaries for very long. It was immediately taken up by entrepreneurial members of this literate elite class and used for secular purposes. So they set up small print shops, um, independent uh, commercial print shops, which published weekly and later daily newspapers in English and Yoruba. Here are some of the Yoruba ones. They published books, notably works on history and religion, but they also published pamphlets, leaflets, flyers, tracts, programs, customs forms, invoice forms, texts of lectures, texts of sermons, and proceedings of elite cultural associations. So here's one of these printers telling you the kind of jobs they're willing to do. Jobs of every description, including um, printing for public societies and other bodies, clubs, and private individuals at the shortest possible notice and at reasonable, on very reasonable terms. So these jobbing printers could typeset almost any text that people brought to them and produce small print runs at a relatively low cost. Also, the local newspapers were always hungry for copy. They were precarious operations. They were always on the brink of financial collapse. They had no money to employ reporters or professional columnists. So they culled other publications for material and the editors often wrote a lot of the content themselves, but they always had space for contributions from friends and members of the public. So the world of print in early 20th century Lagos was quite accessible. It was quite porous and informal. And if people wanted to print things instead of just writing them down, it was a short and easy step to take. So the point here is that print was introduced into the life of the social and personal life of, of the community directly at the same time as literacy itself and into a predominantly and vibrantly oral world. The, the well-established Yoruba oral genres of praise poetry, oriki, historical narrative, itan, divination poetry, essayfa, proverbs, or way, as well as a profusion of popular anecdotes and songs were fundamental to how personhood was affirmed, social relations consolidated, power established and criticized, and the interview interplay of human and spiritual forces diagnosed and ameliorated, and also the way in which events were marked, evaluated, and remembered. And these oral genres up till today still retain enough of these functions, despite the massive infiltration of literacy, for us to, <laughs> to be able to get a sense of how they interacted with the writing that was being introduced. So what I want to ask is what this form of print literacy meant to those in Lagos who participated in it. How did they evaluate the capacities and effects of putting things into writing or into print? How did they themselves see the written words relation to oral texts and discourses? How did they adapt oral genres to serve the purposes of print genres? And how did they adapt print to speak with an oral voice 
so as to draw in readers from the partially literate fringes of the educated elite. And what I'm going to focus on is the Yoruba language weekly newspapers, because they are that's the corpus that has been best preserved and is most complete. So first, how did they make written text sound oral to attract readers who still inhabited an oral life world? The editor proprietors of the Yoruba language newspapers experimented continually with ways of addressing the reader that would engage them in a speech-like relationship. And this is incredibly rich material. I, I can only just touch on it in the briefest way. First of all, they appealed continually to readers. They exhorted them. They quoted hymns and songs and asked them to join in. They said prayers and asked them to say Amen. They quoted proverbs that required recognition and completion by the reader. Almost everything in the newspapers was addressed to a second person, singular or plural. In other words, events were usually not recounted in the third person, but they were commented on as if to the people concerned. Local news revolved around prominent personages, mostly men, of course, lawyers, doctors, clergymen that I mentioned earlier. And when their activities were reported on, they were hailed with oriki, with praise epithets, this being the genre through which status is not only recognized, but also confirmed and conferred. So for instance, you have Dr. Oguntola Shakpara, who had the oriki, which you could translate as the magician of midwifery. He was so famous for his, his um, help given to pregnant and childbearing women. Or the lawyer, J. Edgerton Shingle, a great campaigner among the radical elites, You'd have to be mad to mess with shingle. And there were dozens of others, uh, other uriki of this type, unfailingly uh, uh, quoted whenever the bearers of him were mentioned in the press. So the press continually tried to create a, a feeling of oral exchange. But second, how orality was um, captured and preserved and frozen in print. So how print was charged with preserving valued oral texts. And it was always said to be for the benefit of future generations. So the educated elite saw literacy both as the executioner of oral traditions, because as they said, no one wants to be an oral poet anymore. Everyone wants to be a clerk. So they could see that this aspiration to literacy was displacing this, the oral poets and performers who had had prestige in the earlier dispensation. But they also saw print as the savior of these oral traditions, which were, they thought, on the brink of disappearance. And they thought that if they didn't write it down, all this wisdom of their forebears would be lost forever. So uh, an example is that the editor of one of the weekly Yoruba papers in 1923 put out a call for contributions from readers. He wanted them to write down and send in examples of Ori Ilewa, our indigenous songs. And he said that not only would he publish them, but also our Kaoleti song, we were even willing to pay for them. And this he saw as a public service. By printing them, he explains, he would save from extinction precious poems that provoke thought and preserve the memory of exemplary people. And two weeks later, he showed one of the results of this call. 
So the bottom left, you see Ori Big Baji. Ori is song. It's a, so a song by the popular poet Big Baji, which com commemorated a local big man of the 1890s, Kaibu Wu Boraima, who had built a splendid house but died suddenly in 1899 before he was able to spend a single night in it. So this was a popular topical song by a, a street performer um, fairly recent times. Um, and this was the, the main kind of poem that these newspapers collected. They weren't collecting ancient hallowed oral traditions. They were collecting things that emerged from living memory in their own life world. But they were felt to contain examples that future generations could learn from. In this case, maybe the wisdom of accepting that no condition is permanent, that wealth doesn't protect you from misfortune. So they phrased it as preserving heritage, but seemed to be concerned with fixing the recent or even the present moments, parceling it up and projecting it into the future. Uh, and then thirdly, I want to look at the way both these impulses, the impulse to oralize print and the impulse to fix orality, could be combined in new genres where both the existing print genres, which included letters, editorials, lectures, and existing oral genres, which included popular songs, sayings, and stories, interacted and were repurposed to produce a new form. And the best example of this is a famous text produced in 1929 to 30 by one of the most creative newspaper editor proprietors, I.B. Thomas, who edited the newspaper Akedieko, the Lagos Herald. So almost every week from July 1929 to March 1930, he published in his paper a series of letters purporting to be the deathbed confessions of a former good time girl called Segilola, which was a nickname designed to conceal her real identity. And she was said to have used her enchanting beauty and youth to make a fortune seducing and exploiting big men about town. But then at the height of her success, she was struck down by hideous and disfiguring disease. She lost all her wealth and she's now on her deathbed and she's writing to the editor asking him to publish her story so that others can learn from her sad fate. Future generations can learn to avoid what she did. Now this narrative was very lifelike. It was anchored in real time and in real urban space and her outpourings were very colloquial and emotional. A lot of readers apparently believed that Segulola was a real woman writing into the newspaper every week. But in fact, it was a very artful and deceptive creation of I.B. Thomas himself, who produced a lot of corroborating fake evidence to support the idea that Segulola was real. Soon after her last letter had appeared, the whole series was republished as a book, advertised there in the same paper, and it's now retrospectively regarded as the first Yoruba novel. So the ostensible message of this text was consistent with the Victorian morality of the elite Christian press as a whole, and the moralizing was laid on very thick Segulola's repentance was extreme. Certain episodes were even broken off because her tears were preventing her from putting pen to paper. And that tone probably not very surprising since Thomas was an enthusiastic 
churchgoer who was very given to moralizing in his editorials and he was even invited to give guest sermons at the churches of towns he visited during his editorial trips. But this text is not as monolithic as its strenuous moralizing might lead you to believe. Because although it's ostensibly narrated in a single voice and speaks of only one person's experience, Segilala's, the texture of this story, Itan Ibesiaye Imi Segilala, is in fact very patchy. It's, it's plural and self undermining. And this is because Segilala evokes the Lagos of her youth, which she sets in the 1890s and the early 1900s by lavishly quoting the popular songs of the time. As you can see, this is one chapter. She quotes songs several times in each letter. In fact, in 31 letters or chapters, she quotes 38 popular songs and six hymns and one psalm. And the popular songs all strike a distinctive note. They accentuate and make explicit certain tones of voice that are only fleetingly, if at all, apparent in Segulola's own words. And this voice is cynical, humorous, defiant, sarcastic, and worldly wise. So, for example, when Segulola is steeling herself to face the public shame of having lost her virginity before her wedding night, she then consoles herself by remembering and quoting the popular song which went, We met it on earth, taking lovers, having paramours, having paramours. We met it. We are not the ones who started it. In other words, this kind of thing has been going on for a long time. What can you do about it? Don't worry about it. So writing down, collecting, and preserving oral texts in this work of fiction served a new purpose. It qualified the ostensible repressive message. And this is very probably one of the reasons why the Segulola story was sensationally popular. But it also shows that the Lagos literate elite may, might have underestimated the capacity of popular oral genres to survive, because they all thought it was on the brink of extinction if they didn't write it down quickly to save it. I found this out because a few years ago, after having published a book about Segilola, I was invited to launch it, as they say, um, in Lagos. And this was great, actually, because the state governor's representative was sent to buy a hundred copies to be distributed to all the government offices for edificatory, presumably, purposes. So I was invited to give a lecture on the subject at Lagos State University. And as an example of the novel's use of popular topical songs, I cited one about a man called Yesufa, who had attacked passers-by with a gun from his rooftop. And this became what Segilola describes as a great event in Ekbetedo, which shook the four corners of Lagos for a long time. Um, and then she quotes the song, Yesufa, the old man, is going hunting. Um, so I put these words up on a slide as an illustration of how some old songs of Lagos have been preserved through print, upon which the whole audience, which was about 500 people, burst out singing. They sang the song of Yesufa, so it was still in circulation despite the fears of the 1920s literati. So, to, to draw some conclusions from this, I want to suggest that these 
print men of the 1920s were asking questions about the affordances of prints and the value of oral genres that resonate with some of the fund fundamental issues raised in this conference. Issues to do with what is written down, what can be written down, what's left out, why it's left out, and what is the purpose of writing text down. And I think it's helpful here to start from linguistic anthropologists' notion of entextualization, the process of rendering a given instance of discourse as text detachable from its local context, because this applies to oral as well as written texts. In this view, it's not writing that confers textuality, it's the putting together of words in such a way that they can be repeated or recreated in another time and place. They're detachable from the here and now. And this means that already within orality, creation of, a creation of texts inv involves a separation from the immediate speech context. And there are continual processes of entextualization in which stretches of words are demarcated, noted, quoted, and recreated. It's a continuing, continuous, ongoing process in speech worlds. In a lot of oral traditions in Africa and beyond, oral composers actually consciously heighten this process of oral detachment from the here and now by making their formulations obscure and riddle-like so that they demand attention and explanation. And in fact, the Yesufa song is a very simple example of this. Yesufa was an actual person and in August 1907, he climbed onto his rooftop and began shooting at passers-by. When he did this, it was because he was afraid of surveyors coming to measure his land and possibly um, requisition it. People around him noted, marked, and commented on this by composing a little topical song about it. But look at the way it comments. The facts that it's commenting on are converted into an enigmatic formulation. The old man is going hunting, but she doesn't tell you what he was hunting or why he was hunting. You have to know the story. And in fact, many Yoruba oral genres require you to transmit a narrative, an itan, in parallel to the song or the praise text in order to provide the explanation. So the meaning is constituted through the interaction of two genres, not encapsulated entirely within one. Now, the Lagos literate saw print as a means of greatly extending and increasing the time and space over which text could pass and still be re recreated, recuperated, or repeated. And they were actually very excited by the idea that print could reach the four corners of the world, as well as carrying forward over time to future generations. And they, although they were well aware of the fact that what was preserved by print was only one part of the Yoruba mode of oral text constitution, they didn't try to devise ways of also preserving the explanatory and contextualizing narratives. They instead converted these texts into generic moral lessons or even just heritage, something that they projected forward into the future so as to be valued as something coming from the past. And in this, they also recognized the crucial fact that in preserving oral traditions by writing and by print, we also transform them. But it's a transformation that occurs to different degrees and in different ways with all intextualization, all production 
and transmission of texts. So I'll stop there. Thank you.